So I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Chris Cochran, who's going to moderate the panel. But before I do that, I want to start with a question that's already come in for the panel. Um, and the question really deals with um, uh, oversight for MAID, which is much higher than uh, oversight for decisions to withdraw ICU life-sustaining care. And the question is really about whether um, the two should be aligned, and if so, in which direction. That's a very good question. Uh, and it's interesting, when you look at the early withdrawal case, especially in New Jersey, they did mandate much more oversight for withdrawal of treatment. Like in some cases, they would want the state ombudsman to um, be consulted and to have, um, just like we do with MAID, a, an independent second physician consulting. So we did see that early in the withdrawal days, but it we don't see it so much. And I think as you've heard a couple times, the, the concerns people raise about the patient take up of MAID and might there be inappropriate cases, you would see the same or more cases with withdrawal of treatment. To the extent we see studies, they, they do raise the same concerns. Um, so it's interesting that we don't, we, we see all these safeguards, the waiting periods, if you, why not a waiting period for, before you turn off a ventilator? If you think a psychiatrist ought to be consulted in every case, in, as in Hawaii, why not for withdrawal too? So, um, but I, I think what this may suggest is that we haven't seen enough problems in the withdrawal setting. And so that maybe is reassuring for the aid and dying setting. Thank you, David, for, for your response. Does anybody else want to take tackle that question? This I is think Chris Cotter's hand is up. I'd like to comment sorry. when he's done as well. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I think, uh, I mean, David, you've you hit on it exactly, which is that, you know, we've got, you know, uh, it, I think in the U.S. and in Canada, probably a quarter and maybe a third of the population is dying of withdrawal of life support entire like i mean and let's be very clear on what like substitute decision making or what you call surrogate decision making is so when i'm an icu physician and i'm trying to decide who the surrogate decision maker is i go into a meeting with the family and i go around the room and try to find the person with the most conflicts of interest and i put them in charge um that's that's substitute decision making right you are you are going for the next okay if this person in the bed dies the person, the substitute maker is the one who's probably going to get most of the money, um, the car, the house, whatever assets are up. Um, you, if they're, if the substitute decision maker it was ever physically, emotionally, sexually abused, um, one of the very most likely perpetrators of that abuse was is the person lying in the bed. Um, you know, it, it, we have to understand what we accept without any oversight whatsoever to put everything else into context. Now, um, and palliative sedation. So in, in, in Netherlands, you know, where you're seeing the sort of slow creep of, of MAID uh, up and, and actually more accelerated in recent years, up to 5%. But in the same time that MAID has gone from one to 5%, uh, palliative sedation in, Bel in Netherlands has gone from eight to 24%, um, no oversight. Right. So like there are very uh, there is a large panoply of study of, of situations where people are involved in ethically contentious or ethically fraught things that are becoming dramatically more common where decisions are being made with often limited to no input from the patient, no assessment of their capacity by somebody with a lot of conflicts of interest. And we're OK with that. I, I think it, I think made I think it's, it's appropriate to have a higher standard of oversight for MAID than for other things. I think that's appropriate. I, I, I think it's unrealistic to expect that same level of oversight for palliative sedation, VSED, withdrawal of life support, and all the other, that, that, we're talking about a lot of death at that point. Um, and, but I think you have to be, uh, you know, I think you have to be mindful that when you consider what you can't measure in all of those other things that you can with MAID, it helps put a lot of that into context. 
On the flip side, though, I will tell you that I've consulted the health authorities six times with questions of ethics or more importantly, questions of law that were really fuzzy. And all six times they said, you need to decide what the right thing to do is. We are not going to use our own lawyers to advise you. And the sixth time they finally said, stop worrying so much. We're really not here to come after you if you in good faith are really trying. The only times I've gotten, if you will, in trouble are if the dates don't match on the witnesses forms and I send it in or I leave something unfilled out. So there really is a lot of power in the physician's hands, to be very honest. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question here. I might uh, want to remind the audience that we do have a question and answer um, slot here. So if you have questions, please um, use the question and answer board for asking the questions. One of the common themes that I heard about through, from all of the speakers was um, the, the relatively low number of um, deaths that this relates to in terms of overall deaths for your states. Uh, and then, uh, and Dr. Bernard, you might want to address this question. You mentioned specifically that you don't have enough providers in providing this service. Is this a, is is this part of the issue? Is why there may be lower numbers than would be expected, or 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 are you seeing the numbers that you would have expected based on this law? I'll let you start off, Diana. Um. Can you just clarify the question again? Sorry. There's a relatively low rate of death of death with the 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 made programs in the states where this is legal and probably also in Canada. I think we see the same kind of statistics. The the rates of deaths are very low. Um, is is this as much related to the availability of providers as it well, is to I, people yeah. who choose this. Okay, I think there's a few things involved. First, I'd say people do want to live. People want to live. And um, so nobody's in a hurry to die. It's only when living becomes unacceptable that they think about it. And, and for many people, it's hard to get both of those things, the timing just right. Um, I want to remind people that how we die is very different, and I expect it to continue to be different as time marches on. Just a reminder, the, the, the living with that heavier disease burden. And so by the time you're overly burdened with disease, it might actually be too late to ask. Um, but it also does imply that we need more tools. And um, I think the one thing that's kind of related to this, but I really just wanted to say also in response to the other question is it's really interesting to think about who is holding the power and whose decision is it? And as I often say, we have a doctor or provider focused medical system, and I don't think that's right. And I think many of us here on this call and who practice medicine and other things really are trying to make this about patients and what they want and what they need. And so as people continue to think about the subject, I just encourage you to keep that in mind. Yeah, I'd like to comment as well, if I may. Um, a lot of doctors are still afraid if they simply list it among the options at end of life, they'll be perceived as advocating for it. And that prevents them from doing it. Second issue is lack of referrals. I cannot tell you the number of times I had a patient finally get to me, pancreatic cancer, their doctor said to them, oh, I don't do death with dignity. I don't know anybody who does. Good luck with it. Literally, good luck with it. Good luck finding somebody. So the patients who get to us are in my practice, a mix. Their doctors actually do support it. Um, but also about half of them find me just by being internet savvy, which of course has its own DEI implications. There are too few providers, however. I'm sure that when we legalize it for nurse practitioners and physician assistants, we'll see the number go up. And I think it will reach a steady state, but it's still, for the reasons that Dr. Barnard told us about, gonna be a tiny fraction of overall mortality. Great, thank you. Dr. Downer? Yeah, just, just to pick up on that point, I mean, you know, access is a, is a big issue. And, and I mean, one of the things that people talk about a lot in the op-eds and the and the, the sort of um, alarmist discourse is around the sort of pressure and the vulnerable populations. When you look at the demographics of who is actually receiving MAID, if I take those demographics and pasted them into a study or a report on the use of, you know, sort of uh, biologics in, in oncology, um, liver transplant, uh, heart transplant, if I if I if I publish those numbers with a therapy like that, there would be rioting in the streets. 
right? Like people would be outraged to think that well, how on earth is this apparent, you know, such an incredible tilt in demographics uh, shown compared to this? Like, you know, the amazing thing about Oregon's data now that we have 25 years of it, and I alluded to this in our pre-discussion, right? So, so Oregon has consistently been able to put out data about their demographics, and and you know, um, Oregon has become progressively less and less white. Uh, over the years. Um, and um, interestingly, despite becoming less and less white, um, the proportion of people receiving MAID hasn't really budged. It's like still in the sort of 93% range. Uh, the number of post-secondary educated has climbed steadily. And yet, um, you know, some individuals who are politically opposed to MAID published a study earlier this year claiming that there is a clear erosion and change in demographics because of a climb a steady climb in the enrollment in Medicare and Medicaid that amazingly started around 2010. There was no reference to the Affordable Care Act in the paper. Um, you know, it's it's the way in which people can continue to look at data and come to conclusions like this or continue to, to, to cite concerns like this um, is, is remarkable. And I think the question you have to ask yourself about vulnerable people is they're vulnerable to get stuff they don't want, but they're vulnerable to not get stuff they do. So I, I think that you that it's a tension when you bring stuff up or you raise something that they haven't raised, but access and, and awareness is is a huge issue. It is. I, I think that's a that's an excellent point. Um, I, I got a follow up question. I'm let David take this on too. I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I just want to tie into the the small number of physicians who are willing to do it, and and I think Dr. Blank, you said that there's a reluctance to be on the list of willing providers. And I was wondering how this compares to what we've seen historically with the marginalization of abortion providers and whether we're, if that's what we're seeing or if this is more of, it's just gonna take a little time for people to become more comfortable. Um, I will answer myself if that's okay. I actually don't, see it changing dramatically. I have a few new docs every year call me up who've been exposed to it and they saw that it went well and they were happy with the result. But there really is this serious concern that it's being forced upon people by rogue doctors. Um, and that makes me really, really nervous. The lack of referrals, I wish referral were mandated. It's a medically legal procedure that's just another option for patients, but we don't have to refer. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that some states were, uh, or at least in the old days, when they didn't provide abortions, they had to refer for abortions. That's not the case for death with dignity anywhere that I know, or at least not in Oregon. I shouldn't speak for the other states. And that's a big problem. Or they are actively discouraged from it, as my partner tried to do for a different patient. I, I was curious as my follow-up on this. Um, in in the data, I I don't know that I saw anything about religious affiliation, and I'm kind of curious about that as a function of the people who choose this. Um, has anybody looked at that data? Does that is is there even a way where that data is collected? Not in Canada. Um, I say in, in Canada, we're we're funny because we have a ton of demographic data, but um, you know, I think the, the usual survey, like I think Americans are very used to filling out questions about race and religion and stuff and political affiliation. Um, Can Canadians don't really affiliate, like you don't register as a voter with a party in Canada. Um, and uh, like if somebody put a survey under your nose, um, I remember the very first time I ever answered a racial question or a religious question was when I wrote the American SATs uh, when, when and I'm Canadian. I've never lived in the US, but I was considering going to a US college and I wrote the SATs and I was I remember feeling shocked by the question because it is the first time I was ever asked that. And I don't think I was asked it for another 17 years. We've only just started collecting race based data in Canada recently. It's considered rude, I think, by many Canadians to even ask it. And so it's generally like like more than half are left blank. And so um, that's a real challenge. There is indirect data when they looked at micro regional um, trends in the Netherlands, um, where we have very good detail on on who gets um, like who votes for what and like what regions and how they vote. The regions that are less religious and the regions that are more voting for left leaning parties have much higher rates of made 
Um, I'm sure having seen a lot of these sort of vaccine utilization and voter registration uh, uh, studies in the US, I'm sure it wouldn't be very hard to do an analogous study in the US, but I'm not aware that anyone's actually done one. Diana, I saw your hand was raised. Well, because this is a legal conference, I just wanted to circle back to Dr. Blanke's comment about the, the duty to refer or inform. And an interesting part of our journey in Vermont, when we were trying to pass our law, there was a lot of talk that, oh, what we need is more palliative care, more hospice. Um, we don't we don't need medical aid dying. And so I, as part of this group of people working to pass this law, we were like, all right. So we wrote a law that um, mandated that individuals be made aware of all their treatment and end of life options. And well, um, and there's a duty to refer for services if you're not comfortable to provide them. We also passed the first mandatory continuing med medical education law in Vermont as part of that mandating CME for pain management with opioids and, uh, and for end of life care. And um, there are still some people that give me the hairy eyeball about forcing that, but these are, these, this is another example of the and. We're trying to do a lot of things better at the same time. I think that's an excellent point. Last night's panel, uh, one of our speakers talked about how the number of people, at least in the state of Nevada, who enter hospice care usually are entering it in their last 17 days of life, even though they've got the opportunity to come in in their in their last six months of life. Is this is uh, I I want to give others the chance to to answer to the other questions, but but just to to think about this, is there uh, are we still are our patients still not informed enough about the role of palliative care and hospice care? And are, is there a reluctance on the part of physicians to talk about that? And so um, just think about that question. Um, Dr. Blakey, you, you had, a, I saw your hand up. Sure. Although I think, well, David will get a chance to talk, I hope. Um, so just get to your oh, second yeah, David. before oh, I forget it. You. I think palliative care is okay now with everybody. There's data, you know, suggesting it should be done early. Um, it's not just for somebody who's two days from dying with lung cancer. So I haven't seen recently any real reluctance to refer somebody to palliative care. However, it hasn't budged for death with dignity. You either believe in it or you don't, and it just don't see evolution. Now, interestingly, the flip side of what you asked earlier about the religion is what's coming from systems like Providence. So Providence, obviously a Catholic system, about 40% of my OHSU patients come from Providence because their doctors will be fired if they write the prescription. Now, every once in a while, I get a call. I really love this patient. I've known them for 25 years. I want to participate. They will participate through their private email as one example, and they pray that the confidentiality that the state promises is maintained so they don't lose their job. Thank you. Uh, David, I, I, I skipped you. Are you muted? Sorry, I, I'm going to continue on the reli religiosity theme that Charles came back to, and, and that is, I also haven't seen any data on patients, their religion. But one thing, I, when I was do, working on a paper, I was curious, overall, if you're comparing where the laws in terms of their strictness are on a spectrum, at the U.S., we're, we tend to be stricter than in other countries, Belgium, Netherlands, Canada, they allow physician or nurse administration. We don't. It's got to be self-administered. Uh, we have the terminal illness requirement. They don't. So, which seems counterintuitive because we're a more libertarian country as a general matter. And so you would think we would be more permissive. But when you look at measures of religiosity, we are a more religious country than other countries that, that have legalized aid and dying. So that may be where the, the religiosity may be a factor and that we have stricter laws in the United States. Well, and looking at the, at the demographics, and that was one of the reasons why I asked the question, because you're talking about a more affluent society, you're talking about, you know, in, the, in terms of the demographics, and I, and I wonder whether or not there is a lack of religion among the, the there's a greater rate of uh, lack of religious affiliation among the population in that group. I don't know if anybody has has experienced that. Dr. Dr. Blanke? 
So I'm loath to say there are no atheists in foxholes as an analogy, but I've tended to find in my practice it's true. So I have attended, and I don't want Dr. Donner to yell at me for anecdotes, but I've attended 300 home deaths now. And the mix of religions is breathtaking. Um, I've certainly had people who participate in the Catholic Church, which publicly opposes this. I've had priests come to their deaths. Um, again, we have to be a little careful with polling data, but the Montana data, 80% of people um, you know, want death with dignity to be enacted into law in Montana. And it's, a, in my experience and very minimal knowledge, a pretty religious state. So I think at end of life, people get nervous and they want all the options available to them. There are definitely people I've had them say, I can't do death with dignity. I had a personal friend say, I'm Catholic, I can't do it. But sometimes they go against what their church teaches. Okay, Diana, I see your hand up and then we'll move on to another question. I, I want to remind the audience that please use the question and answer board. I can ask questions all day, but I'd like to hear from the audience. I noticed that there were a couple of questions regarding voluntarily stopping and eating and drinking. So I wanted to at least address that and remind people that it is a tool, it's a legal tool for people who are interested in hastening their death, who may not qualify for medical aid in dying or for other reasons may find that alternative um, not appealing or not available to them. And also to say that it is, it's a complex process that requires a lot of support and that the symptoms can be well managed with a good hospice team. But one of the ironies is that if you don't have a terminal illness and you voluntarily stop eating and drinking, your hospice may or may not be willing to admit you until you're halfway there. And so, but I, but I do want to say, because I'm such an advocate of different tools, that there there is a process to voluntarily stopping eating and drinking, and we should all learn more about it. Personally, when I talk to patients and families about it, and for probably the dozen of people that I've walked through it, it is difficult on many levels, physically, emotionally, and um, you want a really good team of people with you. Yeah, just to add that on, when both are an option, made and VSAID, I almost always recommend made, but I definitely get people who are terminal, but not within six months, and VSAID's a great option, or perhaps the patients with ALS. Um, I, I, another question I'd like to ask is, particularly for your out-of-state, the folks who come from out-of-state, what is the discussion that is had with them about the post-death? Um, I, I mean, there's got to be this preparation, right? Um, who's coming? Who's what, what? What do you want? What will happen? Are are do you leave that up to them to make those own arrangements? Do you have that discussion with them? Um, I guess I'll answer because I think I'm the only one doing it. Um, no, in fact, I got to answer uh, Dr. Donner's questions. Um, so, first question is, where are you going to take the medication? And I'm actually surprised frequently by them saying, "Oh my gosh, I hadn't thought about that." Um, I told you I got three Airbnb and Bs under my belt, and I'm almost afraid to tell you guys this. I advertised on Craigslist, and I was very frank with the people about what I was looking for and why I was doing it. Of course, I went to the facilities. I interviewed the people just to make sure there was nothing really wonky going on, and they've been incredibly reliable and wonderful for my patients. Secondly, I talked to them, usually actually before they come and say, I hope you realize the law is murky and might require several trips. For example, I told you before, there are th uh, three requests for lethal medication. The second request is literally 10 seconds. Are you making your second request? Yes. Okay, I have to tell you, you could take it back at any time. Done. But they have to physically be in the state. So a lot of them want to get out the stuff under their belt as soon as possible in case they get worse quickly, but they don't want to fly back to Oregon just for a 10-minute appointment. Um, but that's an issue. Third issue, where the witness is located. Needless to say, the, the statute doesn't say the witnesses have to be in Oregon, but there is still the possibility that witnesses who sign in Idaho might be prosecuted for aiding a, a suicide. Mm -hmm. So I tell them you need to have it witnessed in Oregon. And that's really hard. Um, finding somebody who, because we have to have one person who's a family member, we don't have to, but one person can be a family member, one cannot. A lot of them don't have a second person. I actually have a UPS store. You guys are just going to really yell at me for all these uh, workarounds I have. I have a UPS store that will sign that death certificate, or sign their witness statement for $15. It doesn't have to be notarized and it's totally legal, but they have to find somewhere to go. But to get more specifically to your questions, they don't have hospice and they have concerns about the medical examiner, which luckily can overcome. And then the most important thing is 
what is going to happen to you afterward? Have you already consulted a funeral home to either cremate you here and ship you back home? Or perhaps you want to be buried here. But one way or the other, you have to have a funeral home both in Oregon and back home if you wish to go back home. Okay. So I have a separate checklist for my out-of-state patients to make sure I don't forget any of this. I know, Max, you had pointed to a couple of extra questions that I had in the... I don't see any other questions in the question and answer board. So um, does anybody have any questions that you want to ask? I've got, I've got, I would just add for the out of state people interested in coming to Vermont that again, that patient choices, Vermont website has a whole section for people coming from out of state and includes the many additional things that you need to think about and be working on. And it can feel overwhelming when you're trying to navigate the final chapter of your life, but there are a lot of things that you need to pay attention to. And One of the reasons I advocate for hospice is that it's really simple to at least know the death was expected, natural, there's a process for having it taken care of. And we also work with a direct cremation um, for many people. Um, We'll choose that option because transporting a body is very expensive, unfortunately. I, I, you, you mentioned that um, one of the other discussions that we had, and I think Dr. Blanky brought this up, and I'd like to hear from Dr. Downer as well on this, is um, the issue of pain management at the end of life, especially perhaps during hospice and palliative care. At what point or do patients say, I, I know I can be medicated to the point that I don't feel or even am awake? Are they Is, is part of their decision that I don't want to go that way? Yes. Uh, Yes. The short version is yes. Um, I would say when you pull people straight up, I I think that this is, and this is kind of the challenge, right? So like I I have this conversation, I know Thad Pope's in the audience. Um, I've often, you know, for in a legal, in a a place where V said, sorry, where made is legal, I don't get V said, I don't understand it. because it's uh, of all the legal, clinical, ethical concerns that one would have around MAID, it's not clear that any of them are, are addressed by VSET, right? Like it's, a, it's, the same, it's the same notion of a self-initiated process to end your life. Um, the same concerns about capacity, the, the ability to see it through, the comfort level of it is like the, 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 the challenges clinically of managing it are quite different, I would say much hard, harder. Uh, than one to do a made process, et cetera. The oversight and the safeguards are much more clear and, and established in, in made than it is in v um, I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately poking people here because I, I feel like somebody will respond to this, but um, I, uh, I, I think that this is the challenge, right? So then when you, when you try to explain, and again, uh, to the point that, that many people have sort of alluded to, um, this distinction, this hard and fast bright line distinction between made and palliative care, is a really big one in the academic world like in bioethics you can get a really good war going and in law and in medicine to a degree when you stop a bus on the street um it's really hard to find people who are really strongly opposed to maid um certainly in canada but according to polls elsewhere too and and then finding that that unicorn person who is strongly supportive of palliative care and comfort associate oriented interventions but deeply morally opposed to, to MAID, that is a hard person to find statistically, um, according to sort of polls, et cetera. So as a rule, somebody who's embracing of palliative sedation is generally embracing of MAID. And in my experience, you know, there are people who are sort of, you know, they want to try to preserve some consciousness. They want to try to keep the person with you. The idea of being alive isn't just to be alive, it's to be present with the family, um, which unfortunately palliative sedation doesn't, actually help you with that right like it it will take away the suffering but it also takes away the consciousness and so families are then watching this poor person who we are medicating and they're really just waiting for this person to die and i would say you know it's not everybody but but a large number of people are like you know is there anything we can do to speed this up doctor right like it's once you start palliative sedation it's generally from the family's perspective with the idea that they would like this to go faster. And when you describe the two next to each other for patients, it's rare that somebody would be like, oh yeah, I definitely want to, you know, I want it to be slow and I want people to have to watch it happen, right? No, don't yeah. give me that, that quick thing that I just make a decision and it's, it's quick and, and, and sudden. So like, like that's just, that's my, that's my anecdotal experience. I'd love to hear what others are, are seeing. 
Dr. So it's not rare. It's unheard of. If I have a patient who's eligible for either made in palliative sedation or made in VSED, 100% of the time they pick made. But the fact remains in all of the U.S. states, you have to be terminal within six months. And I get people who are ill, but not terminal. They're ill and suffering or they're terminal, but I think you got two years left. And then we cannot offer made. We have to offer alternatives. I'm sure Dr. Barnard feels the same way. Well, I raised the question because we did hear this from from a, a, a speaker last night talking about I don't know why they would choose that when there there are other options. So I I, I it, it struck me as being an interesting, you know, something to ask for the panel because I was just I was kind of curious about that. Well, I will add this is interesting because I've discussed this at length with patients. There is sometimes this onus of suicide with made, and this is absolutely anecdotal. It's so anecdotal. It's solely from my practice. I've had patients feel that they are less responsible for the death if they do palliative sedation, but they still haven't chosen it. Okay. All right. Um, I don't see, oh, David, sorry, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you. So Dr. Blank, I was glad to hear that the advice you got from the state attorneys was, you know, use your best judgment. If you act in good faith, we're not going to come after you. And and that's his. That's what we've seen. Jack Kevorkian, um, while he was prosecuted, we see that you know juries were very sympathetic to him. And it wasn't until he crossed the line and administered the medication himself that he got into trouble. Tim Quill, that they couldn't get a jury to convict him. And and most prosecutors don't even go after doctors. And those were in cases where there wasn't a law. So that's true, Doc, you know, the law, if you're acting in good faith, you'll be okay. Um, but I, I'm curious because in Nevada, we have, we're gonna reconsider which it would, should we think about being more clear on this, one of the things you raised, does terminal illness mean with or without treatment? In advanced directive statutes, they do say to the ones that talk about death being imminent be before your advanced directive kicks in your living will, they usually say light death, um, your death would be imminent with or without treatment. That's actually spelled out in advanced directive statutes, typically. Should we spell it out in uh, an NMA statute in Nevada? I think Dr. Barter, do you have your hand up? Do you wanna speak first and I'll gladly comment? You can go ahead first. Um, you you nailed it, Dr. Ornelick. There's tons of things. You absolutely need to say that it can be terminal um, without treatment and even curable. With, I mean, you don't have to use the word curable, but you have to make sure people understand it's not terminal no matter what we do, because I still see that interpretation every single day. Um, if And we're just asking for pie in the sky. Advanced directives would be great because, as I told you, people take their life too soon because they fear they're going to lose the capability mentally or physically. Um, in my book, the real issue or one of the biggest issues is the self-administration. I understand why everyone's afraid of euthanasia. It makes perfect sense. But there is no doubt we could give the drug intravenously via a pump, and all the patient would have to do is bonk the button with their head or their elbow or their knee or their big toe, and very few patients are completely paralyzed. And that IV administration would count as self-administration, but it wouldn't use the GI tract. I think it would fulfill the law. It made it through the Oregon House and then died in the Senate. And just to, uh, this is not as amusing as I'm laughing right now. When I was testifying before the legislature, my picture wound up on the front page of the paper right next to Dr. Kevorkian and a picture of his death machine. And the uh, heading was Blinky's new death machine. So there still is concern out there. Again, slippery slope to euthanasia. But I, I, I applaud you guys for thinking of all these things in advance because otherwise it's going to come down to the courts or the, later in terms of interpreting how rigid to be in applying the rules. I just wanted to make one comment. I, I think I have a slightly different take from Dr. Blanke, and I think this is a good time to remember that we all can have slight differences in practice styles and prognosis, and that's okay. But this issue of do you have a less than six months prognosis with or without treatment, just to remember that prognosis means like more than a 50% chance of dying. It doesn't mean absolute. Sure. And you're also looking at an individual patient. So you might have an individual patient who wants to pursue treatment, 
that might help a general population, but you might see other factors that oh, yeah. patient has that tells you they're not going to do well. So I feel like there are times when I have people who are pursuing treatment that the oncologist is telling them might make them not qualify. But I actually think they do because I'm seeing other factors that give me more confidence that they're not going to do as well as their oncologist is hoping. This is all about treating one individual patient at a time and doing a thorough job and accepting the uncertainty that exists in all of medicine. We actually do not disagree at all. I just had a patient this week who was on act, active therapy that I just didn't think would be so active. But if you guys will allow me, one of the problems that comes up then is actually the hospice admission. Now we heard data earlier today that indeed most people put on hospice do actually die within six months. However, at least in Oregon, hospice is really pretty liberal. And I would dare say that most oncologists have had many, many, many patients fail hospice by living too long, if you'll forgive that language. They're alive two or three years after they're put on hospice. And hospice was just a really wonderful way to get them excellent care outside of their oncologist. So I love hospice. I put people on it. The six month bar is kind of soft in my mind. There are definitely people who practice death with dignity who say, Anybody on hospice automatically qualifies by virtue of being on hospice in that six-month definition. Like Dr. Bardar said, I look at them, and if they're on hospice, but it is crystal clear to me in my professional opinion, they're going to be around three years from now, I have a painful discussion with them that I don't actually think they qualify for death with dignity. That's just unique to the practitioner. Um, one, one other question on here relates to um, something that I don't think any of the states do here, and um, regarding um, patients, this may deal with patients, as you've mentioned, we've had discussions about this, who have um, dementia issues or cognitive issues. Um, I, I know that this is an allowable form of treatment. I don't think, uh, Dr. Downer, Dr. Donner, if this is something that, that they, they do in, in Canada, I, I don't recall in the discussion, but um, it's, I, it, to my knowledge, this is something that none of the states do in, in the U S although they do do this in other countries. Yes. Is there, is this in the foreseeable future? Uh, yes. So, um, in Canada, you know, we, we're sort of, you know, and, and, and hats off to you guys in states where, you know, you have a situation where you have, you know, either through citizen initiate initiatives or, um, through your legislature, you know, you convene committees, you study stuff, you work with the regulatory authorities and the, and the, the medical physicians groups and other providers, and you try to work towards a system. Um, the, the Canadian approach, the, 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 the biggest concern that I often flag to people about how this happened in Canada is because it happened as a result of a court decision um, and, and to be, you know, like, you know, all the sort of state sponsored uh, comments notwithstanding, the, the government was dragged into this kicking and screaming. They were the only ones in the country that basically didn't didn't think this was a good idea. And um, and they were dragged along. And so there was a lot of kind of last minute setting up uh, different different uh, arrangements, et cetera, et cetera. So we're working through the whole uh, legal process that was decided to pass a bill that where it was sort of initially limited to, you know, people with reasonably foreseeable deaths, but not uh, mature minors, psychiatric made and advanced directives, which are sort of the sort of things that are legal in many in parts of Europe, but not in Canada. Um, those were sort of, they put a pin in them, said, we're going to strike committees to study that. It was said right off from the bat that we, we just don't have enough data to know what to do about those. So we're not going to put them in the initial bill. Um, so there, it is abundantly clear that this is a huge, huge uh, point of concern for a lot of the population, right? So um, whereas psychiatric made, which is a bit kind of controversial, not everybody, it, when you pull people that they don't necessarily, it kind of splits. It's the one aspect of MAID that is, is probably still controversial in the public. Um, but when it comes to advanced directives, um, you know, this is really a strong concern of many people and particularly among seniors uh, that they want this option for if they develop dementia. Um, it's a really big deal. And so the fact that we don't have it, so um, Canada is a bit funny, like we don't have the whole states rights, federal rights thing that you guys do. It's it's kind of interesting to look at it as a Canadian and try to decide 
I was joking with that earlier on Twitter about, you know, um, does the state have a right to restrict other states' rights to restrict individual rights? Um, and this is kind of a legal question, which I don't know the answer to. But in Canada, our version of states' rights is Quebec. Um, so for cultural and historical reasons, Quebec kind of goes its own way on a lot of things. And Quebec actually was starting to pass a bill before the court decision, and they had done the committee studies and done all this stuff. And they are already pushed forward with a bill that would legalize it by advance directive in Quebec. It's not entirely clear whether that would stand up federally to any sort of challenges, but it's clear that in general, Canada doesn't like to have inconsistent laws between provinces. So we'd like, we're probably heading in that direction, uh, that that will be legal soon. Where it is done, um, it is not commonly practiced at all. So it's it, in Netherlands and Belgium, it's been, it's been legal for a long time very, very rare numbers. And, and a couple of, a lot of this is sort of driven by, I think, physician discomfort. Like, you know, it, it, I have a level of comfort when someone is telling me that they're currently experiencing a level of suffering, et cetera, and that they're willing to forego the remaining life for the rationale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing is, people can write instructions. Like I, as an ICU person, you know, I occasionally do look at advanced directives, and then every time I do, I remember why I don't tend to look at advanced directives because they're not that helpful, right? You sort of people write down these scenarios that that don't correspond to what's in front of me. Um, they give sort of you know, like if I can't recognize my family, I would write if I if I'm incontinent. Well, if you can recognize, but what happens in Alzheimer's is that you recognize your family, you just don't remember which member of your family it is. Um, is that a, is that the same thing? They're incontinent because they had a UTI, but if they don't have a UTI, they're not incontinent. Um, they can eat some things, some days they eat, some days they don't eat. Um, and if they look like they're comfortable, but they said previously that if they were ever in this state, they would, they would want to end it, but they don't look uncomfortable, I, that's a challenge for me to say based on you know a document written before this sort of Ulysses contract right like do I do I do I stick to this right and and I think a lot of people have a high level of of di higher level of discomfort with that scenario even though the public really 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 wants this and so that's a that's a bit of a challenge and that's why I think even though in the Netherlands where it's widely accepted culturally it's it's not commonly used it's nuanced in the U.S., though, for a different reason. Now, obviously, you could have mental illness and a terminal disease. You can be schizophrenic and have pancreatic cancer. As long as you understand that if you take the medicine, you'll die, you're kosher in the U.S. But in general, mental illness itself is not terminal. So you're just not going to qualify at all. However, the exception is anorexia nervosa. We have had a number of patients now, while you don't obviously die directly of anorexia, they can predict with fairly high accuracy who is going to die from cardiac arrhythmias and advanced a, um, anorexia. Now, there have been several patients in the U.S. who have taken their life with that diagnosis, and it has caused a you-know-what storm. The first patient I know of was in Colorado. The doctor who wrote the prescription wrote an op-ed piece along with three co-authors, one of whom was one of her patients, and it made it onto the uh, Boulder Sun or the Denver Sun, and she had to actually almost go into hiding because she came under such attack from the psychiatric community. So it's hard and anorexia is hard. Are there any other questions while we're talking about this? Um, here, I see one. Would you offer sedation for, I, I guess, I guess we're talking still about folks with dementia. Would you offer sedation for them? I, is that I, I, if I'm reading that question correctly, um, it's a follow up to um, the questions about advanced directives for future dementia. Um, I, I do know that this, I, Dr. Donner, your explanation actually, I mean, it, I, I think you make some good points. I think, though, among especially older populations who have witnessed um, dementia and Alzheimer's among their loved ones. Um, it's one of those issues that probably underlies their 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 real fear about their end of life situation that, you know, do they going through that potentially not so much for themselves, but for their families? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things also you sort of you speak to um, and, and, and you sort of alluded to this, I think. The, the thing about the criteria that you find is even where it's broadly legal and, and you know, like in Netherlands and Belgium, which sort of allows uh, sort of the limits of what is legal and um, you, you tend to find that the same people show up, right? Um, the mistake a little bit, I think, in this debate is to believe that the eligibility criteria make a huge difference in who ends up getting made, right? That those sort of humans are like these sort of balloon full of 
um, you know, directionless, a, a motivational atoms that are just bouncing off the wall, you know, randomly in some Brownian process. And that, you know, you're here trying to decide how big a hole you want to make in the balloon uh, to allow people to get made. Um, the overwhelming majority of people are eligible for made before they die. About probably 95% of Canadians would be eligible for made at some point before they die, and 4% take it. And of those who take it, the vast majority were eligible for quite some time before they actually requested it. They would have been eligible. So again, there's there's an internal the the, the biggest safeguard against made is the fact that people internally don't actually want it until except in very specific circumstances they want access to it and so you know this is when you look at you know despite quite broad variations in eligibility criteria around the world and practices and, and social services etc that you get very similar numbers and certainly the ratios of cancer to non-cancer and all this other the ratios are almost perfectly preserved across jurisdictions, which is, you know, suggests that the major driver is very much internal to individuals, not external. Um, so, you know, when we talk also about, you know, getting palliative care earlier and earlier and hospice benefits and, you know, timeliness of palliative care, yeah, we, we should get it in earlier. But yeah, there are a lot of situations that you see where people are just not in that mindset, right? Like they're, they're, if I were to dangle palliative care in front of them, it's not like they said, oh, where have you been all my life? Um, you know, there there are some who are like that, and you know, I, I don't take it personally, and I'm, I'm sure it's just because up until a certain point, they're just not in a headspace where they can, where they're ready to embrace that, right? And and so that's why the transitions tend to happen quite late because you know, for many conditions, it's just how it is. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's an important uh, you know take home message on this. Okay, but the other huge difference is. You can request palliative sedation by advanced directive. You could uh, request palliative sedation by a healthcare proxy. Both yeah. of those are absolutely forbidden for made. Correct. Okay, I think we're going to have to end in there. I I do want to thank our panelists. I think this is, you know, for me, it's been a fascinating discussion. I hope our audience also enjoyed the presentation. I I thought everybody did a, a, a superb job in, in tackling this issue, um, and um, I am assuming. Um, uh, Max, you may know, will this information be available as part of a, um, something that people can view or, or, uh, the presentations be available for, for the audience? Yes, I believe that there, it's being recorded and the recording will be made available. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Again, I, I want to, um, thank our, our presenters, um, uh, Dr. Oren Lichter, Dr. Charles Blanke, uh, Dr. Diana Bernard and Dr. James Downer um, for their presentations today. I want to thank the audience for attending and participating um, and um, keep um, vigilant about future series hmm. in, in the health law discussions. Thanks very much to everybody. Good weekend. Thank all. you all. Thank you, everybody. Also thank you, everybody. Our sponsor, the Nevada chapter, the American Absolutely, College yes. of Health Executives, Debbie Gorov and Sandra Rodriguez. And uh, professors Gack and Cochran, who did so much with the planning. And our next program for the health law program will be March 21st. It'll be also a virtual program. So we'll send out information to those of you on our mailing list. And thank you to our presenters. You, it was, this was terrific. And really, it really takes a village. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. -bye.